name. Amen. Okay, so take out your Bibles and turn to the book of Mark chapter 5. We're going to start there. And we're as we're here, we're going to look at this occasion of Jesus. As we go through the book of Mark, the book of Mark is, is great because it's real uh, to the point. It's just power packed. I like that. It's just, it shows the exploits of Jesus. Um, sort of to me, it puts them on display with um, less narrative, I think, than a lot of, um, than some of the other gospels. Some of the other gospels we get um, more depth, I think, but in Mark, it's just. Uh, for those with the short attention spans, this is the book for you. <laughs> so, now, um, before we get into this, uh, you, it's important that we understand the context and what's ha happening here. So, Jesus, um, as we're going through Mark in this section, he's going around and he's ministering. So, um, we have all these different occasions and all these different miracles and all these different things that he's doing. And we just finish chapter 4 with the account where he um, stops the wind and the waves. He rebukes the wind and the waves. He told the disciples to go, we're going to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And as they're going, the wind and the sea, they end up being contrary to them, meaning making it scary and difficult. At the same time, Jesus as he commanded them or said, let's go to the other side. That's all they needed to know about if they're going to get there or not. So the question is, do we know if we're following the Lord and we're following what he's revealed in his word, then, then we know we're going to get there. That's what's important. There might be waves, there might be wind, there might be obstacles. But if Jesus says it, what? It's going to happen. That's where faith comes in. Jesus has been working with the disciples, tr continually trying to draw out faith. And uh, so that he would say a lot of things like, oh, you have little faith, or he would say, um, where is your faith, rebuking them. But notice something in this occasion. So as they're going across, Jesus wasn't just going across the Sea of Galilee for no reason, right? Jesus just doesn't randomly do things. He was going across the Sea of Galilee specifically for a reason. And when Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves, what happened? Still. Yes, they listened to him. The wind and the waves listened to him. Interesting, huh? The wind and the waves, they, they listened to Jesus. They did exactly what Jesus said. So that brings us to um, our chapter, chapter 5. So watch this. So... So it says, then, then, so he's, it's, it's playing off of the fact that he did that, now he's doing something else. Then, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. So now uh, they're going to a place where the um, tribe of Gad settled, actually. If you go back a little bit more of, in history, the tribe of Gad settled on the east side of the Jordan, you remember God was taking them across the Jordan into the promised land, and the tribe of Gad wanted to hang out back on the other side. Interesting. So the, this area here now, we find, and there's, there's probably a play in here where uh, those from the tribe of Gad who didn't want to fully obey God going into the promised land, but they wanted to sort of linger in the back. They didn't want to be too dedicated or too committed or too into it. They just wanted to kind of be associated with God things, but, but not too into it. Well, this is the area then that we find 
that there's uh, something very interesting going on in this area. So it says, um, it says in verse 2, it says, And when he had come out of the boat, Jesus, when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. So when you follow the, the Gospels around, you see this um, fairly often. Uh, this is speaking of uh, demons, uh, demon possession. This guy was actually demon possesses. Uh, another word is an unclean spirit. So Jesus gets out of the boat. And no doubt, this is why Jesus wanted to go over there. He didn't just randomly run into the guy. So, but it, interesting that as he meets this guy... There is a, a suddenness to it. It, it. it almost seems like as soon as he stepped out of the boat, this guy was there. Watch this develop now. So this guy with the unclean spirit, he says in verse 3, who, who had his dwelling among the tombs? That's where he lived. And no one could bind him, not even with chains. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. So um, we get, get this picture that, okay, so here's a, a guy. The other um, gospels give us a little bit more information. This uh, account is also in Matthew chapter 8 and Luke chapter 8. And they tell us that this uh, individual had been like this for a long time. Uh, this individual, we're told, was also extremely fierce and was unclothed. So he, he was a, a naked guy who was fierce, who was supernaturally strong, who lived among the graves or the tombs. And he, he lived in an area where they tried to do something about it. But no matter what they did, and notice there, the solution was let's just put uh, shackle them up or chain them up or lock them up. But none of that, none of that uh, worked. So um, we don't know how this guy got like this. We don't have that information. But there are some things that we do know about demon possession. First is the obvious is that it's possible. Second maybe not so obvious, sometimes people have this question, um, a Christian cannot be demon-possessed. Why can't a, de a Christian be demon-possessed? Because a Christian is already possessed by what? The Holy Spirit. And we're not a duplex. We're a single-family dwelling. So Christ in us is the protection from being um, demon-possessed, yeah. However, Christians, we experience spiritual warfare. So we can't be demon-possessed, but uh, at the same time, there are forces, demon, demonic forces that are contrary and counteract and looking to work against the things of God in our life. And so we have to pay particular attention to these things, especially if we're going to walk in obedience to the Lord, we will encounter on that road all sorts of things. So uh, what are some of the things that, that may, uh, maybe we're not going to be like this guy living in a graveyard naked, and he's also, he also is a cutter, he's cutting himself, and with that... But what happens to us is Satan looks to stymie the work of God in our life. He works sort of like an insect repellent. Um, he, he works in a way where um, God wants to bring spiritual fruit in our life. And what he does is try to prevent that fruit coming forth from our life. Um, so maybe not an insect repellent, but maybe a, a, a toxic fruit fly or something where he comes and eats away at the fruit of our life. 
Um, what that can look like for us are some of the symptoms maybe is that we will, have, we, we will have a tendency to withdraw from people. We will, uh, especially Christian fellowship and um, Christian gatherings, not withdrawing, which is healthy like Jesus did for a time just to seek the Lord, but there's a, we won't want to be around Christian people generally. Um, there will be a tendency to feel oppressed or extremely lethargic, like we won't want to do anything. We'll just want to sit around, want to um, isolate ourselves, sit around. We'll feel um, depressed even and dark. Um, some of the things that um, Satan tries to steal is our peace and our joy, um, our love, uh, love for one another. So those sort of things that Satan will will work to try to bring us into that type of position as Christians. So now, another thing that we need to point out is um, not only can a Christian not be demon-possessed, but can be demon-oppressed, we can say that, um, or demon-resisted. But we also know that whatever demonic activity that he puts forth, that we have every bit of what we need in our relationship with God to be successful to overcome the spiritual warfare. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us about the armor of God, right? So we have the armor of God that we put on. All those things are, uh, when you look at the armor of God, basically those are just a Christian walking in the truth of who Christ is and who they are in Christ. So walking in the truth, Satan has no, uh, no weapons that can really handle that. Um, and we're going to see this a little bit more as we go along. So those are a couple things. Another thing I'd like to point out is if we truly, uh, if we truly understand spiritual warfare, um, we have to understand that Satan's desire for all of us is to destroy us, to hurt us, to harm us. Um, the Bible says that uh, Satan is a liar, or a liar. He's a murderer. Um, that's what he wants to do. And if he if he had his way, imagine what he would do with us. If if there wasn't any um, protection or resistance from the Lord, here we get a, a picture of somebody like that. That that Satan is has his way with, but still not fully. It's because these demons, they, they would like to kill him and send him to hell for eternity. So we still see the hand of God here. So watch this unfold a little bit more. And it says, uh, verse 5, it says, And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out, and cutting himself with stones. So I find that interesting as well, because um, sometimes we find people that cut themselves. That's uh, something that a lot of teenagers do when they're uh, upset or have some kind of thing that they're going through. It's a way for them, uh, psychologists tell us, it's a way for them to feel like they have some sort of control and also a way for them to feel like um, the pain that they feel inside is less when they're inflicting pain on themselves. It's a very strange thing, but what we find is that that's something that's demonic. And so that's something um, we find also when people are tempted to commit suicide or they do commit suicide. Something that, um, at least in my experience, which um, I had a recent experience with in November, I shared that with you on a Wednesday night, where a young man from Flower Mountain High School, I think he was a sophomore, took his life. And um, I sat there in the living room with his parents as they just found out about, a, about an hour before I got there. And then this happened again. Uh, the next week, another young man did that in Flower Mound. And then I heard this happen again, maybe a week or two after that. Um, 
and this this person was I think the third person was like 21 years old I just heard about this but what you find is uh, a lot of these people say that they hear a voice telling them to kill themselves and this uh, I've heard this over and over again from people um, even uh, a lot of people that have been tempted or attempted to commit suicide they, they hear a voice talking to them saying that to do that and so uh, that's something that Satan wants to do is inflict harm and punishment on an individual um, so we, we have to answer another question which often comes up is uh, how does a person get demon possessed we don't know in this in this section of scripture how exactly that happens and everybody doesn't get demon possessed that's not a Christian. So why are some people actually demon possessed? We're not sure exactly why, but let me just throw a couple things out there to think about. But they're not it's, Christians, are they? That's correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. A Christian can't be demon possessed. No. Right. So somebody who's not a Christian, how do they... How do they get demon-possessed? Because not everybody who's not a Christian gets demon-possessed. So how does that happen? It seems as if uh, an individual's participation in different forms of darkness seems to give um, Satan an avenue or, if you will, an open door to come into that person and possess that person. And we do find that uh, evil spirits demons, unclean spirits, they do, it does seem like they, they like to inhabit people, indwell people. They don't always do that, but it seems like they look to do that. So a couple things to think about. So an individual, one, who gets involved with drugs, that's a big one. I think a lot of people that get involved in drugs open themselves up to demonic possession. The word sorcery in the Bible is a Greek word pharmakia, which we get our word pharmacy or drugs from. And so it seems like drugs are, are one of the most prevalent and most obvious ways that a person could get demon possessed. Um, another way is participation in occult practices, um, voodoo, um, idol worship, um, Things like um, even satanic worshipers and those type of things. Um, even people that get involved with um, like Ouija boards and those kind of things. They're just, um, they're curious and they're interested in phenomenon and spiritual experiences. But they're not turning to the Lord. They're turning to darkness horoscopes and all that kind of stuff, they, that seems to um, put a person in a position to possibly be de demon-possessed. So those are some things we can go on and on. I think music has a big role in that. I know there's a heavy influence in, in music and um, people that listen to certain types of music are driven to do certain types of activity. The beats that they use in music uh, used to be rock and roll back in the day, and a lot of those old rock and roll artists were actually um, self-professed uh, Satan worshipers. And so they would do things on stage that would be um, Satanic worship type of activities with the music that can get people in a, a trance in a certain type of state and draw people in like that. And then there's usually, of course, drugs involved with that. And then um, sexual activity, that's another way. Um, perverse sexual activity um, can also be a way that that can happen. So we see different ways, we see different things and we can go on about that. But the point is, it's real. There may be people that are demon-possessed that you don't realize they're demon-possessed. A lot of people in prison probably have been or are demon-possessed. We see the supernatural strength. Um, boy, it sure be difficult to be a police officer these days because they have to deal with people like that. And you may have seen, um, now we see more videos and things come out where um, they've, 
Sometimes there's a, a criminal or somebody doing some criminal activity and uh, several police officers can't take them down. Even with, when they get tased and stunned, that's a supernatural strength. A lot of those guys are so high on drugs too that uh, they almost have this supernatural strength. So an unpleasant subject to talk about. However, we have to be sober-minded and we have to be uh, understanding that uh, a lot of things that, that we may see as maybe a physical condition or a medical condition or a psychological condition, we have to just at least entertain the thought that maybe this is a spiritual problem more than anything. So we see the story continues. Jesus meets this guy in verse 6. says, when, when he saw Jesus from afar, so the, the man with the unclean spirit, he ran and he worshipped him. So that's kind of interesting. So uh, that worship is not the kind of worship we do to the Lord. This is this demon, which is interesting, or I should say this man who is demon possessed, actually had a response to Jesus. You notice that um, this, this powerful dark entity had no respect of persons except for Jesus. Notice his reaction. He automatically put himself in a position where where he was, knew he was lower than Jesus. So he didn't worship him like we do. He worshiped him like everyone will, whether they're a believer or not, one day when the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Not everybody's going to do that to salvation if they've rejected Christ in this life. But everybody, once they stand face to face with Jesus Christ, they're going to bow down before him because he is so powerful and strong. He's the creator of all and second member of the Trinity. So there's, you're, he's going to be so powerful that we're, people are not going to be able to do anything. But here's what's interesting. It was possible for people to reject Christ, wasn't it? Or to not worship Christ. But it's not possible for weather and creation. and nat It's not possible for those created things to not worship Christ. And it's not possible for evil spirits not to worship Christ. That's interesting. So God's made, made us different where he's given us a choice. But isn't it interesting as you look through the Bible... The rocks cry out. The, all of nature respects and obeys Christ. Even demons do. But yet God's given us the ability to, to actually reject Him. Amen. That's amazing, isn't it? That's a heavy responsibility. But here's what we see. So He's worshiping Him. He, this demon has correct theology. Watch. The demon cries out with a loud voice and he says, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Wow, so he he even he's identifying him correctly. This is something that uh, a lot of people struggled with up to this point. Even the disciples did, didn't they? They struggled with who he was and Jesus Asked Peter, you know, who do men say that I am? And, and they had all these different answers. And he said, well, who do you say that I am, Peter? And Peter had the right answer. He, he identified Jesus correctly. And so here we see demons, they know who he is. That's, if you're in that realm, the spirit realm, well, you know who, who Jesus is. So even demons worship Jesus know who he is, correctly identify him. And then it says, I implore you, the demon saying this, by God that you do not torment me. So the demons knew that Jesus had more power than them. So here we find out that the really the only answer 
to demonic power is Jesus Christ. So you couldn't take this guy to a psychologist and get him fixed up. You couldn't have him look into his upbringing and the problems that he's had in his upbringing and fix him. You couldn't incarcerate him and hope he would become a better citizen. You couldn't go, have him go through a Tony Robbins class and have him be a more positive person. He couldn't even go to Joel Osteen's church and be more positive. <laughs> he, needed, he needed Jesus Christ. He needed Je Jesus was the only answer. Isn't this interesting? Because we have to ask ourselves, well, we've gotten too clever for the simplicity and the power of Jesus Christ himself. Do we enlist the power of Jesus in our life, or we, do we look at 10 different other possible solutions until we've exhausted those and say, well, maybe I'll try Jesus now. Here we see something so powerful is that we as Christians have the power of Jesus Christ. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's why we as Christians, we should not fear. The Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. We don't need to be ghostbusters because we have the Holy Ghost. We don't need to look around and, and look under rocks and behind corners that there might be an evil spirit dwelling there. I'll just tell you, they're all around, but we don't worry about them. Why? Because of Jesus. But if we don't have Jesus, there's great room for concern. There's great reason to fear and to be afraid. So he says in verse 8, he says, For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. That's Jesus. And then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered and said, My name is Legion, for we are many. So Jesus is dealing with this evil spirit now. And we need to really clue into this because it's possible that someday, somewhere, you may actually encounter somebody who's actually possessed by a demon. If you were, would you know what to do? This is telling us what to do. So after this, you should know what to do. First, you have to be really careful. If you're not a Christian, don't mess with it. If you're not a Christian, don't mess with it. If you are a Christian, don't fear it. So what you do, if, if you're dealing with the person that is demon-possessed, the most important thing to do is to do what you would do, the same exact thing you would do if you're trying to lead somebody to Christ. Demons can't handle the name of Jesus. If you, if you met a demon-possessed person and you said Jesus, and you really wanted to mess with them and go, Jesus, 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 <laughs> it would be like pouring salt on a snail. They would hate that. So, but when you're dealing with this, if you're dealing with this, you, you, you lead a person to Christ. You ask the person, because if a person demon-possessed, there's a struggle for control in this person's life. But you ask the person if they want to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And you persist down that road. And if a person, person does, the spirit has, has to leave. But... Um, what also we know from Scripture that if a person has a demon cast out of them, which I wouldn't encourage you to get into the demon casting out business, but if you happen to be, hey, if you go to Haiti, you're going to run into demon-possessed people. And you may go to Haiti because we're going to go probably pretty soon. So if the demon gets cast out, and the persons, does, they don't get born again. They don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. What happens? More demons come back into them. 
The problem with that is Jesus asked the demon what his name was. What did he say? Legion. His name's Legion. You know what that means? In the Roman, Roman soldiers, a legion of, sol of soldiers would be 6,000 soldiers. This demon is saying that his name is Legion. We do know, as we go through a little further, that there were multiple, high multiples of demons in this guy. So the, the legion or the demon, the unclean spirits, notice that they have to respond to Jesus. So Jesus asks him, what's his name? And he says, my name's legion. Look at verse 10. So now the, the unclean spirit is begging him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Not send him out of the country. That's interesting. So... It seems, and I want to look at this a little bit more as we go along, but what we're seeing here is an individual possessed by the Spirit, right? But what it also seems like, and we're going to develop this a little bit more, is that there are demons over areas, as well controlling areas. We'll see this a little bit more. But this demon didn't want to leave. They had a foothold in this area we don't know how long we don't know exactly how they got there but but this area of the gatherings it had gotten to a place where there was demonic activity and the people got comfortable with that demon activity to the point where they they didn't really even think it was that big of a deal so watch what happens in verse, um, verse 11. So the, the demon's saying, hey, I don't, I don't want to go. I don't want to go out of the country. Um, can you do something else? And so a large herd of swine was feeding near the mountains. And so all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. So the, the demons were really looking for possession. Now, what's interesting, we have to ask ourselves the question, why were they asking this? And why did they want to do this, uh, seeing this as a better alternative of just, just being cast out? Well, they were, they were concerned that Jesus would put them in a place where they wouldn't be able to function anymore like a certain set of demons who are reserved for punishment until later on. Remember those demons? Jude talked about it. Genesis um, 5 talks about it. Was it Genesis? No, Genesis, help me out. The, um, yeah, Genesis 5 with uh, Nephilim and all that. Yeah. So there's a certain demons that Jude said cross their normal domain. They got involved in um, human affairs where they shouldn't have. human, And so they're put in a place they, they can't do things anymore on earth. So that's probably what these demons were saying. And notice they wanted to be cast into uh, pigs or swine. And Jesus actually led them. So it kind of begs the question, well, why did Jesus do that? Why was he, may look at it like, well, why was he acquiescing to them? Or why was he being nice to them and saying, okay, we'll go do that. And I, I think there's some things that we can take from that. So I want to point those out here in a second. So in verse 13, it says, and at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits, notice it's plural, they went out and entered the swine. There were about how many? 2,000. 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. That's All those demons were in this guy. That's pretty heavy duty stuff. So think about 2,000 pigs. That's a lot of bacon. <laughs> bacon was not a good thing to the Jews, right? 
This gives us a, a, an indication of their straying from or their compromise um, in this area because they weren't following the things that the Lord showed them. So we see great compromise in the whole area. Um, now, so why did Jesus permit this? Something to think about. I believe that Jesus permitted this because he wanted to show the people of the town, the, the people that were there, um, and uh, the guy, one, that they were in sin, and two, the desire that Satan had to also do the same thing to them. So, one, one, in one sense, Jesus was rebuking them for their pig farming, which is a violation of the Judaic law. And so he dealt with that all in one swoop. But he also would get the attention of the people, and they would realize through the destructiveness. I mean, imagine that scene. 2,000 pigs running down a hill being destroyed in the water, drowning. Imagine the livelihood of a lot of the people there making their living through selling bacon and sausage. Imagine their, uh, the, the visual that would take place there. And we see that from that, that Jesus was making a statement that this could have been the guy being destroyed like those pigs, but for the grace of God. And then later we'll see, this could have been those in the town, because that's what Satan wanted to do to the guy, right? That's what he wants to do to people. But it's the grace of God that's holding back the fullness of what Satan wants to do. So look in verse 14. It says, so those who fed the swine, they fled. And they told it in the city and in the country. So the news was going out quickly. And they went out to see what, was, uh, what had happened. So the news goes out. This is a, a dramatic scene. And the news goes out and they all come back to see what's going on. Now let's not forget the guy who had those demons cast out of him. It's easy to forget that there was a really messed up guy here. There was a really messed up guy that could not be helped. And this guy, it says in verse 15, then they came to Jesus and they saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. What? Weird. So now the guy's good. So just like that, he met Jesus. And, and notice the respectability that comes back. He's clothed now. I don't know where he got his clothes or what, but he's clothed now. He's sitting. He's not running around screaming like a maniac. And he's calm. And it, isn't this an amazing picture of what Christ wants to do versus what Satan wants to do? Yeah. Satan wants to reduce a human being who is made in the image of God to an animal, to the lowest common denominator. Christ wants to lift that person up, to clothe them in his righteousness, to put a right mind in him and a right spirit. This is such a contrast. I love this. And so we have to remember that too, that, that God has given us the, the ministry of reconciliation, that we too, in the name of Jesus, that we can give beauty for ashes, that we can give those with the, the, the most horrid lives and the most horrid sins that they too can have life in Jesus Christ. That's what this is showing us. 
And so we need to be also aware, circumspect that maybe a lot of those who we would have a tendency to stay away from or think it's better if they just stay in the hills with people like them. But we have to be prayerful and open and realize that a lot of the activity that we may be repulsed by or disgusted by is the activity that Jesus wants to save people from. And maybe many of us were like this guy. Maybe not demon-possessed, but maybe. But maybe we here were going down a horrible road. And yet Jesus saved us. He made us respectable. He put our right mind in us, a sound mind. And so look what happens. The people around, they see the guy and they were afraid. Now, it seems funny because it didn't seem like they were afraid of the demon-possessed guy. They may have been, but I'm sure they were in shock what they were seeing because of how far this guy had gone. And now they're, they're seeing a whole different guy. And they're, it says they're afraid. So you think about it. If you came across this scene and you realize what had happened and you realize who did it, you would hope that you would have a response that would be like the wind and the waves or like the rocks crying out. But it says in verse 16, it says, And those who saw it told them how it happened and had been, that he had been demon-possessed and told him about the swine and they began to plead with him, with Jesus, to depart from the region. Jesus, leave, please. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? So we all come to these places in life. I believe everyone has these moments, these maybe uh, life-defining moments. This is a life-defining moment. It was for the guy demon-possessed. But we will have these life-defining moments, too, where we are we're put in a position where God is giving us this clear opportunity to make a decision for Him. And I believe that's what's going on. The undeniable evidence of what happened and the pointing of uh, this miracle to Jesus and what He did and yet the, the people were faced, they're faced with the decision now. And Jesus, just his very nature of who he is, forces us to make a decision. He doesn't even have to do anything. But just because he's Jesus, we're forced to make a decision. And to not make a decision is to be decided. Jesus is, is and we see this through the Gospels, he's, he's looking to bring out faith. He's doing the same thing here. And I believe... That's why he went across. And I believe that's why Satan stirred up the wind and the waves. Because when Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves, it was the same word that he used to rebuke the evil spirits, the unclean spirits. It's interesting when we go in the way of the Lord, with the word of the Lord, we will be opposed. Just so the weird things will happen to try to stop us. The key is to keep persisting in faith, trusting in Jesus. So now the town is brought to a place, a deciding place, and they, they wanted Jesus to leave. Why did they want him to leave? Probably had something to do with Jesus disturbing the whole balance of the area, disturbing their ability to make money, they would have to do something different. They're, they, they're forced to probably, I don't know how many more swine they had left, but that's what happens. That's why sometimes people are so resistant to Jesus because they've, they get so entrenched in a way of sin that it doesn't seem that bad anymore. It doesn't seem as sinful anymore. And it just becomes normal life. And here comes Jesus calling us out of our old life to a new life. And many people just can't handle the thought of 
I'd have to give up this and I wouldn't ha be able to do this anymore. And if I become a Christian, I can't sin like I normally do and go sin where I normally go and listen to the things I listen to. And, but see, that's the, wrong, that's the wrong way to think. The right way to think is to come to Jesus just how you are. And Jesus will transform and change you. You don't clean yourself up and then come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and He cleans you up. But so often, so many times, people are reluctant to come to Jesus because they, they think, well, I don't want to be like one of those weird Christian people. Like they just go to church all the time and they're nice all the time. And I don't want to be like that. Well, you don't have to be like that. You come to Jesus and let him change you because what he has is much better than what you have. Trust me. And so cultures. So we see it going from an individual to kind of the culture now. Jesus wanted to change the whole culture. He did, didn't he, with his disciples. But not everybody and not everywhere. And so we see culturally, sometimes people worship their culture more than they worship Christ. Unwilling to change, even as sinful and as bad as it may be, because it's cultural. And culture and tradition can be a powerful idol. They didn't seem like they were willing to break with that culture. So it says in verse 18, it says, And when he had got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. Isn't that cool? The demon-possessed guy went from being a fierce, exceedingly fierce, naked chain breaker, tomb liver, craze monster to clothed in his right mind and saying, hey, Jesus, can I go with you guys? He was a follower immediately. He didn't say, okay, now I'm clean. Now where can I find some more pigs? Something very interesting here. He changed man, loved Jesus. He, he, he wanted to follow Jesus because he loved Jesus. He who sins much is forgiven much. And he just wanted to be by Jesus. But watch what happens. In verse 19, however, Jesus did not permit him and said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis, the area of ten cities, all that Jesus had done for him, and they all marveled. Amen. So here's something interesting. So the demons, they ask Jesus' permission, and he granted it to them. The guy who got healed by the demons asked Jesus permission, and Jesus said no to him. This is interesting about prayer life, isn't it? So a lot of times we say our prayers aren't answered, or they're not answered in accordance to what we want. And I would just encourage you to be encouraged in your prayer life one, to keep praying, but two, also be thankful that many of your prayers are not being answered the way you want. God had a, a bigger plan for this guy. And his plan, notice there's a, 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 the response is they, they marveled at the guy. So it's possible, we don't know, but it's possible that after their initial reaction, now the guy goes back and begins to proclaim Jesus to them. And maybe many of those people got saved. It seemed like a positive response. They marveled. They're like, wow. Almost like, tell me more. That's, that's awesome. Now Jesus is using this guy much better that he was doing that. But I, I want you to see something that's so, 
so crucial is that in our unanswered prayer, that just means as Christians, what happens when we become Christians is that now God has this amazing plan for our life. And that's why as we pray, a lot of times those prayers are not answered in the way we want them to because God is actually now leading us. It's not like we just, just do whatever we want. God's saying, no, now, now it's directed. Now your life is pointed. Now your life is meaningful. Now it has purpose. So keep praying, keep seeking, but also understand that there's a huge thing that God is doing. And even in the unanswered prayers, take part in that and be thankful for that because God has something way better than you than even the things that you know about and can see. So this is one account. Let's look at uh, another shorter account. If you just go to the left in uh, Mark chapter 3. So we see Jesus and we see spiritual warfare in, a, in an individual which kind of uh, spread out to an area. But watch, watch what happens here. We're going to go uh, chapter 3, and we're going to go verse 20. So it says, Then the multitude came together, so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out and lay hold of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said this, He has Beelzebub, which some people think that means uh, as a reference to Lord of the Flies or means that. There's some dispute, but it just, it's not a nice word for him. So remember, Jesus is, is doing all these miracles, and they're saying, he, he's, he has a, a demon. They're saying Jesus is doing this by the evil spirit. And by the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. So Jesus is taking harsh criticism for the good works that he's doing. In verse 23, So he called them to himself, and he said in parables. So this is a parable now, so don't get confused about this is... Jesus explaining something about what they're doing. This is not um, an actual account of something that actually happened. But he says this. He says, how can Satan cast out Satan? He says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand and if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. So here's so now we see something interesting too. So we see spiritual warfare in an individual. Now we're seeing in, in this parable spiritual warfare that we can look at as, as in a household. So um, Jesus using this parable, he, he's saying that first of all, a house divided can't stand. What he's being accused of can't make sense whatsoever because it doesn't make sense for someone to oppose themselves like Satan doing a work against himself. That's what he's saying. So he's basically saying that if he, that if he were doing what he was doing the way that they were saying, that that would weaken, not strengthen his point, his position, or his power. But what we learn is that is something interesting. So, what Satan wants to do in household, so we can look at this as a family household, um, we can look at it as the body of Christ household, 
We can look at it maybe as even an employer household where you're working for a company or whatever. But I think um, most importantly, let's look at it as a family household. So what Satan's desire is, is one, is to destroy, like the, the story of the pigs, the swine. But two, then in households, he divides. He knows that a house divided can't stand. And so what Satan does in a, in a household situation, or let's say a body of Christ, he's constantly working to divide people, to pit people against each other. And so here we see Jesus in this parable teaching us something very important. What is he teaching us? He's, he's saying, as Christians, what we do and Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 says this, that um, we storm the gates of Hades. In other words, there are things that Satan has a foothold in, a lock in, a sway over, a persuasion, a, a stronghold. And as Christians, and Jesus said this to Peter, uh, as Peter made his confession of who Jesus was, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not, paraphrasing, will not prevent you from storming them. Now, what does a gate do? It keeps you out. The job of the church, what the church does, is storm the gates of Hades. What we're doing now is storming the gates of Hades, getting into the word, praying together, worshiping God together. And so what Satan does is we're storming, we're storming his house. So what Jesus says in this parable, he's saying, what you have to do, if you're going to go into somebody's house and take their stuff, which Satan has ripped so many people off, that's the church is to go and get back what Satan has taken. But to do that, you have to bind him first. You want to tie him up. You want to render him ineffective, in other words. How do we do that? Well, the most important and effective way to storm the gates of Hades is to bind the strong man by prayer. Amen. So we pray. When we pray, Satan has no answer for that. When we pray, we render Satan ineffective. We paralyze Satan. There's nothing Satan can do when we pray except to tempt us not to pray. Amen. So what we do is we pray. Jesus said, my house will be a house of prayer. We pray, and when we pray, we bind the strong man, and we go doing what we do in the name of God under the power of prayer, and nothing can stop that. Amen. So in the realm of spiritual warfare and spiritual battle, prayer is vital. It's key. In fact, we see when, when we look at the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, above all, pray. So we have all these armor, all these things that are characteristic of the, the walk of a Christian. And then he says, walk in those things and pray. How powerful is prayer? Ask yourself this before we look at the last thing. Things. Prayer changes things. Prayer is the power of the church. Prayer makes all the difference. And I want to show you that. If you'll turn to the last thing we're going to look at. Daniel chapter 10. We're going to finish there. Daniel chapter 10. So we've seen spiritual warfare on an individual basis. We've seen spiritual warfare uh, in, a, in a household basis. These are all things that Satan is looking to bring down to hurt to destroy and then the last thing is very interesting now we see in Daniel 10:10 10, 10, well I'm just going to I'm just going to get into it so Daniel 10:10 10, 10. so Daniel gets a vision very powerful strong 
vision. And we'll pick it up in verse 10. It says, suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. He's talking about how he got that vision. That's pretty powerful, right? Amen. So we've seen spiritual warfare uh, in the uh, negative sense, how powerful the darkness is. But we're also seeing how powerful the light is. Obviously, the light's more powerful than the darkness. It's no competition, really. But we see uh, Daniel is just an amazing guy, one of my favorite characters of the Bible. And we see how God, it, it actually says Daniel was uh, loved, beloved by God. And he was a vessel that God used so powerfully. And how did God use Daniel? What he, did, he, did he use him for? To speak the word. This is so powerful. Speaking the word. We've seen that when Jesus was facing his own temptation. In Matthew chapter 3, it is written, it is written, it is written. That's how he overcame the temptation of Satan. But anybody, and even Paul the Apostle, he said, pray for me that the word of God would multiply, that it would run swiftly in the hearts of the people. Satan hates the word of God. Satan hates people who love the word of God. Satan hated Daniel. Daniel had a word. He has a, a word from God that was going to change things. He was going to give people an understanding. And this is how he got it. So it says in verse 11, it, it says, And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, Understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. Who is this? This is an angel. An angel has been sent to Daniel. Daniel, get yourself ready. I'm going to give you something impactful, something meaningful, something that is going to change lives and affect people. And Daniel's receiving that with such humility. Fear and trembling. He wasn't arrogant about it. He, he, was, he was low, but God said, stand up. He was fearful, and God said, you're, you're beloved, you're cared for, and, and this word I'm going to give you, it, it's like what he says to us too. God's word is powerful in our own life. It's transformational, and it's effective for us and those around us. So he says, while he was speaking, in verse 11, this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God. Those are such keys there, right there. Please listen to this. Do you desire to hear from God? Do you desire to know God more deeply, more passionately? Daniel had this desire to understand, but then he also coupled that desire with great humility. Those are the two keys to incredible insights to the Lord. Please understand that. Seeking the God, God, seeking God, wanting to understand Him, wanting to hear from Him. And please note that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. God just doesn't throw out truths to the person that is neglectful or lethargic or complacent or those who mishandle it. It's to those who want to understand, who are humble, and then will speak it exactly as they're given it. So key. But watch this. He said, Dan, you, you set your heart to understand this vision and to humble yourself before God. Your words were heard. He's praying. See that? Daniel was praying about this vision. He's praying about it. And notice what he says. This is so key. Your words were heard. 
I hope that encourages you. When you pray, your words are heard. And you may say, well, it doesn't seem like it. Well, hold on a second. Should you just give up then? Don't give up. Please don't give up because your words were heard and I have come. Why? What's that next word? Help me out. Because I have come, the angel's saying, because in direct response to your words. Do you see something there? What if he did not pray? I have come because of your words. He came because he prayed. Does prayer make a difference? He came, he's saying, intimating, hinting, I came because of your words. If you didn't have words, I wouldn't have come. That's what it's saying. How powerful are our prayers? But notice this. Daniel still may be saying, man, I've been praying for a long time. Well, look at this. Want to pull back the veil to spiritual warfare a little bit? He says, you've prayed. I'm here because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, Persia's Iran now, withstood me 21 days. What is he saying? Daniel, you prayed. This is an angel. I tried to come, but an evil spirit that he's calling the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. Basically, there's a battle going on. Did you know when you pray, there may be a battle that goes on. That's maybe why you don't get microwave answers to your prayer. So should you stop praying? What if he prayed only 20 days? It says he prayed 20, 21 days and this angel was coming and yet he was being withstood or challenged or he held back by the prince of the kingdom of Persia. So there, there's this huge spiritual battle going on. And it went on for three weeks. But look at, he says, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So the angel's like, I'm so glad you kept praying because I was being withheld. And what do you know? Michael the archangel comes. Bam! I have help now. And here I am. And it's all because David kept praying. I'm sorry, Daniel kept praying. Guys, this is so huge. This tells us something else. This tells us that it seems like not only are demons looking to individually affect people and affect households, but it seems like there are certain demons that are assigned to certain areas, geographical locations, like Flower Mound, like Texas, like America. You keep going out like that. But interesting, huh? Think about the, the possibility that there are specific demonic forces trying to hold Flower Mound in bondage to the certain place that Flower Mound may be in that holding back people from truly knowing and thriving in the things of God. And God says, man, we need to pray. If we really care about our town, we need to really pray for our town. Really pray for our town. So watch this. and We're almost finished. So now the, the battle is won through prayer. The angel comes, Michael helps, and verse 14 it says, Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. So he gets this incredible vision. We're, we have it recorded in the Bible. It 
it resonates on into eternity. And, and yet, we have these things in the Bible. Here we get a glimpse of screen pulled back. A lot of times we just don't realize what's going on behind the scenes. A lot of times we may just feel the effects of spiritual warfare. A lot of times we just may get into the flesh or feel like giving up, feel like quitting, feel mad at everybody, feel like rebelling. Guys, take heart. If you're feeling that, it's probably as a Christian because Satan is greatly concerned about you. If you're getting attacked, it's probably because you're a threat to the kingdom of darkness. And God has equipped you and prepared you to be more than a conqueror. But you have to understand, I have to understand that there is a great spiritual battle going on. And God has called us for such a time as this to lead the way, to head the way, at least in our realm and sphere of influence, to stand up in the power of God, to be lights of God, bringing people out of bondage into a relationship with Jesus Christ. So that's my spiritual warfare talk. <laughs> Uh, wow, right on time, too. Let's pray. Thanks, thanks for listening. Lord, thank you so much. Um, I pray that this would just be another reminder for our church how important it is to pray, to pray corporately, to pray individually, to pray over our families, Lord. I pray for the households that are represented, that there would be great peace in our households, great unity. I pray that well, we would see our households as a place of worship as well and a place where we would want you to um, dwell richly, Lord, that you would feel comfortable in our homes. And Lord, help us in uh, these things of the world that, that crowd in, the darkness that crowds in, sometimes even unnoticed, Lord. And um, just kind of steal the fruit in our life like a fox would in a vine of grapes, Lord. So I pray, Lord, that um, this would be something that would uh, shake us all up, but also encourage us to enlist as good soldiers in this great battle with you, Lord, at our side and even leading the way. We have nothing to fear. Break down every stronghold in our lives, Lord, by the power of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.